So we're going. Yeah, we're going now. <laughs> That's on the video. Chapter 21. Uh, I'm going to read it. For me, it's just basically one page and about three verses. Uh, not sure how it'll work for you. I think it might, might work better for me if I actually use my readers. But here we go. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Anybody know what the Sea of Tiberias is? Sea of Galilee. Exactly right. It's basically the lake or the Sea of Galilee. You said right. 20, right? I'm sorry. 21. John 21. And he, he said 20 to start, and then he changed it to 21. Okay. Well, 21 is right, so I didn't realize I said 20. Pardon me. I am past 50. It happens. <laughs> After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. In other words, this is the way he showed himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, which means twin. Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples. Simon Peter says unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then said Excuse me. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John talking about himself, saith unto Peter, This is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Let me just run this by you. It's my understanding that he was not actually naked. But you know how <laughs> probably the girls, more than the boys, you went to go out sometime when you were a teenager, and your mom said, you ain't going out naked like that. <laughs> Basically, if your thigh was showing, if you had on short shorts, that would have been considered naked. So I don't think he was out there with his six buddies fishing in in, the, in his birthday suit. I believe he's in his skimmy drawers. You know what I'm saying? So he covered himself before he went to see the Lord. Verse eight. I don't know what's so funny, but here we go. The other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with the fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up, and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty-three. So they didn't have any little ones, they were all big ones. Mm -hmm. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said to them, Come and dine. That was one of my favorite songs when I was a kid. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. And after that, he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He's talking about the fishes. He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, unto him, feed my lambs. Amen. He said to him again, and the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, feed my sheep. Amen. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? How many times did Peter deny me? How many times did Jesus make him publicly declare his love? Three, three times. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. Notice it didn't say 
This he spake, signifying what death he should die, but by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, this is a problem that we all have. Notice what Peter does. Then Peter turneth about and seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So he's remembering what John asked Jesus at the supper. Mm -hmm. Peter seeth him and saith, Lord Jesus, what shall this man do? Lord Jesus, Lord, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. That's a pretty good lesson right there. We don't need to look at other people. We need to look at the Lord. Okay? Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, He shall not die, but he did say it not unto him. He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? In other words, people started telling everybody, hey, John ain't going to die until Jesus comes back. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said to Peter, if I don't want him to die until I come back, what is that to you? Mm -hmm. This is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know Jeremy's always prayed over the prayer request, but as I pray before we preach, I do pray that you would give me your mouth, Lord. I pray that you would help me to put distractions and disappointment and discouragement aside and allow you to speak through me tonight, Lord. I pray that this uh, would not only be an encouragement to your conviction, to your people, Lord, to your congregation, but I pray that it would encourage me, Lord. I pray that it would not only uh, convict anyone that may hear it who may uh, not be heading in the right direction, Lord, or who, who may be uh, wallowing in disappointment and discouragement, Lord. I pray that you would just use it, whether it's me or somebody else who may be listening who's discouraged or defeated, Lord. I pray that you would use this to point us in the right direction, Lord. Draw us closer to thee. Purge us of sin and prune us of unfruitfulness that we may glorify thee. In Christ's name, amen. So this, this final chapter shows us Christ is both the friend of sinners and the master of the servants. Okay? If we didn't have this chapter, we might wonder if we might wonder I'm from the South. It's hard to tell when I say W-A-N-D-R and go in some place, or wonder, W-O-N-D-E-R. We might wonder if the Lord ever addressed Peter's disobedience. But this chapter makes it clear that he did. So I told you on Facebook, a lot of y'all liked it, so I'm sure you've seen it. But we start with the first three verses as a night of discouragement and defeat. Okay? Now, I often ask people, Otis, to raise their hand if they've ever been discouraged, if they've ever suffered defeat in their Christian walk. The fact of the matter is, if we're honest, every one of us would raise our hand. We've all had discouragement. We've all had times when we failed the Lord, so then it was defeat, right? So I'm not going to ask you to do that, but I guess the amazing thing to me is we become discouraged at the time when the Lord provides encouragement. Most of y'all know, in fact, I guess everybody in the room knows that, uh, you know, some hurtful things were said this week. But it amazes to me that, it, it, it amazes me that my God is so caring that the same day that happened, I got encouragement from another source. Amen. Hey, preacher, thanks for... Hey, I really appreciate it. God doesn't leave us comfortless, right? Mm -hmm. Even if a person doesn't speak to you when you're discouraged or defeated, we have the Holy Spirit Amen. if we choose to dwell on the right things, right. right? The scripture doesn't say, dwell on your discouragement and the God of peace shall be with you. It said, think of things which are pure, which are lovely, which are of good report. 
and the God of peace shall be with you. Right? Kind of a mind thing. <clears throat> and, but when we get in those, those times or those feelings of discouragement and a defeated spirit, sometimes we do just what Peter did. Peter acted without orders. Now, there's nothing wrong with a pastor working, obviously. I don't think so. Your pastor works. Amen. Paul worked. He made hints at times to support his ministry. But Peter had forsaken all to follow Christ, and he goes right back to the same thing. Everything about this scene speaks of defeat and discouragement. It's dark. How are we supposed to be encouraged? Walk in the light as he is in the light. Mm -hmm. We have fellowship with him and with one another. It was dark. No direct word from the Lord. He's just doing what he wants to do. His efforts failed. He didn't even recognize. This is the thing. is we can get so, I, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. But I think the scripture makes it abundantly clear, not only here, but in other places, that we can wallow in discouragement and defeat so much that we don't even hear the Lord when he speaks to us. Right. We don't see him standing saying, come and dine, the master call it, come and dine. I mean, he's given us a meal to get us through this life. He's given us a spring of living water, and we quench it. Okay? Amen. Peter did just, just didn't go astray. He took at least five people with him. Now, how often have you heard this lie? I'm trying not to look over there because I might be a little long tonight. How often have you heard the lie, I'm not hurting anybody? We hear that all the time, right? I'm not hurting, I'm not hurting anybody. Or we might say if we're at least pretending to be discerning, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. Don't think me carnal. But we need to remember the truth of a couple of 1980s songs. A man named Rockwell had a song, Somebody's Watching Me. I'm afraid to wash my hair. I may open my eyes and find someone standing there. Well, obviously, we hope nobody's standing outside the shower, but people are watching you. Billy Squire said, somebody's watching you, speaking to others. Rockwell said, somebody's watching me. The fact of the matter is, S.M. Lockridge said, I've told you this scores of times, S.M. Lockridge, one of the most powerful preachers I've ever known of, said in the 1970s, there are five recordings of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and your life. Mm -hmm. And most people won't read the first four, but they're going to watch you. When we go astray, it's not just us. Other people will follow us. Okay? Remember this. If the world hates you, if other professing Christians hate you, they hated Christ first. Mm -hmm. You realize it was the religious crowds that pushed for his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. As I told you Sunday, the same group that said, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! For the most part were the same ones that said, Crucify him! We have no king but Caesar! It's real. To be honest with you, Jennifer, in my, I, I have been saved for 44 years. I have been striving to serve Jesus for about 27 years. And in 27 years, been few times that a lost person gave me a real hard time. But other Christians have tried to destroy me on multiple occasions. How do you know they were Christians? Okay, other professing Christians. Other people who go to the same church, who preach from the same Bible, etc., Look, bad influence is tragic. We must keep in mind that God blesses us when we abide in Christ and when we obey the scriptures. That's where the blessing is, is in abiding in Christ and obeying the scriptures. What did Jesus say? Without me, 
you, you can, can do nothing. nothing. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Too many times. Maybe they mean well. But too many times, we as Christians enter into unscriptural activities that are a waste of time and energy. We get impatient. Beware of impatience. Beware of, of boredom. Hmm. It's better to wait for directions from the Lord and let Him less as we follow his leading than to involve ourselves in useless activities. Okay? So then, discouragement and defeat. What about discernment and decision? When Christ is, he shows up on the scene, light begins to shine. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's teaching them from the shore. He's instructing them from the shore. Hey, do you have any meat? Cast your net on the other side. And they caught a bunch of fish. All nights laboring on their own desires, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Two minutes following Christ, and they almost sink their ship with success. Mm -hmm. Okay? Compare this to Luke 5, right? In Luke 5, Christ gets in Peter's boat. Peter launches out a little... And Christ teaches the crowd on the hillside. And then he tells Peter, hey, you throw your nets over there, you catch some fish. So what's the similarities? Well, both of them, both of these miracles follow a night of failure. I don't know that these are significant, but the other differences are that you don't get any exact number of fish in Luke 5, but in John 21, he says 153 fish were caught. Okay? The nets began to break in Luke 5. The net didn't break in John 21. Christ instructed them from the boat in Luke 5. Christ instructed them from the shore in, Luke, in John 21. Now, some believe these to be, and I think it's, it's a pretty good analogy right here. You, you, you don't want to over-allegorize the scripture, but there is at least a little nugget of truth here that these scenes seem to be from the church today in Luke 5 and the church at the end of the age when Christ returns in John 21. We're casting our gospel nets. Sometimes nets break. There seems to be failure. We don't, we don't know how many souls are really one. I have told you about somebody who made a profession of faith since I've been here, but they're involved in such things. I wonder if that person really came to know Christ. They're involved in such things that the scripture says not once, not twice, but seven times. It has no part in the kingdom of God. It, 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 they, they refuse to repent. They have their part in the lake with burning from fire, fire and brimstone. And it is outside, without, as in not inside heaven. I don't know. Sometimes we wonder, are we wasting our time? But when Christ returns, we will know just exactly how many souls got saved. Amen. We won't lose any. There are many boats and fishermen at work today, but when Christ returns, everything, all the truly saved people will be gathered into the one church, into the one net. This is other little, maybe insignificant figures, but they couldn't even get it into the boat with two boats. They had to drag it between them. But when Christ said, bring me the fish he caught, Peter grabbed it by himself, the scripture says, and pulled it. Man, that's interesting. <sighs> Miraculous strength to the servant from the master. The fact that the net didn't break, that's another miracle. Nothing is said previously about Christ building a fire, but when they get there, their fire, there's a fire of coals. What, how long has the fire been burning if there's the coals? Pretty well. For a little while, all right? And he's got breakfast ready, but he's been standing over there teaching. He's been standing over there telling them what to do. <clears throat> the entire scene seems to be inspired by God, designed by God to open Peter's eyes and awaken his conscience. If you're born again tonight, Surely there's been at least two times that's happened for you. The first time when you realize, 
hey man, I'm lost, and without Jesus Christ, I'm going to burn in hell for eternity. The other time is when you sit there and you realize, you know, I've been saved this long, but I ain't never really done anything for Christ. And your eyes wake up that he can use you. Your eyes are open to the fact that he saved you for a purpose. You know, nobody gets on Christ's team. I, I played ball, Otis, with a boy named Ben. I can't even remember Ben's last name. But Ben was on the baseball team just so he could say he was on the baseball team. He did not want to get in the game. He would actually sit in the dugout, Carolyn. I don't know how much British people know about baseball. It's nothing like cricket from what I can tell. But he would sit in the dugout, dirt dugouts in Mississippi, and he'd take that dirt and he'd rub it in them white pants so he could go home and tell his mom and dad that he slid in and he did this, that, and the other. He didn't want to get in the game. Jesus didn't save anybody to ride the pine. You understand? Mm -hmm. Ride the pine. The benches are made of pine. He didn't save anybody to just be a pew warmer. If you're born again tonight, he's got something for you to do. Peter had denied Christ three times. He made him basically declare his devotion to him three times. You ever been in trouble with your daddy? <laughs> Did you <laughs> cease to be your daddy's child because you were in trouble with him? I disappointed my daddy several times, Jennifer. I mean, to the point I, I, I was afraid to see him because I knew I disappointed him. But his love for me never stopped. That's right. To me, I think another notable thing in our text is that Christ fed Peter before he corrected Peter. His care doesn't stop. Even when we are disobedient, rebellious children, just like that prodigal son, he didn't cease to be the son. He came back with a speech to say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of your hired servants. But he didn't even get to say it. His father said, hey, bring the robe. Get the ring. Kill the calf. The prodigal son has come home. That's the way Jesus is for Peter right there. He fed him before he corrected him. Man, do we disappoint the Lord? I am positive I disappoint him. Hopefully not often, but I'm sure that we do probably more often than we realize. But I'm very thankful for the fact that I never cease to be his son. Amen. And that even when I'm messing up, I know that my Redeemer lives and Amen. I know that my Redeemer loves me. Mm -hmm. If we love Christ, our lives should be devoted to him, dedicated to him. Christ gives Peter a new commission. Uh, feed my lamb. Amen. Feed my sheep. Amen. Basically, God called him to be a pastor mm -hmm. at that point. First Peter 5, 1 bears out that he was a pastor. He's now the shepherd and feed the sheep. Amen. Feed him the word of God. I grew up thinking it was the pastor's job to win people to Christ, Jalen, but it is every born-again believer's job to be a soul winner, to be a fisher of men. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. The fact of the matter is, if we're not fishing, we ain't following. If we're not fishing, if we're not at least inviting people to church, then we're not following him as closely as we should be. We've got different people fish in different ponds. I'm looking at some mothers in the room. Well, hey, you're fishing for your children. And you have to ask the Lord, who else you're supposed to fish for? But I know you're fishing for your children. I'm fishing for other people's children. I'm fishing for grown-ups. Fishing. 
is follow. And following Christ is fishing. But if we're all to win the lost, don't we have to have a place to disciple them? That place is the... Where are we going to disciple them? Church. Exactly right. The call to shepherd a flock is not to be taken lightly. And no shepherd, no true shepherd takes it lightly. I have some warnings for me and you tonight along these lines. From Scripture. You know, Hebrews 13, 17 says, I'll flip over there and read it to you. We'll try to hurry along because I really am going to try to be done in 15 minutes, but I'm going to have to kick it in high gear if I'm going to manage that. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. Respond to it. I'm not going to be able to color that. Now, do I know exactly how this account is going to be given? I don't, I don't know. But I do know it's going to have to be like Dragnet, just the fact. But patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Joe, if you don't know what a street is, is that somebody takes off her clothes and runs down the street, all right? One that ruleth well his own house. We don't want any pastors doing that. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Notice the allusion to ruling there. Bishop means overseer, a uh, director, manager, not a novice, not somebody who's just recently been saved, lest he being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So how is this for both of us? Well, the pastor's an overseer and a manager. That means I have to be in charge. Okay? That means you have to follow. It's for both of us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them highly for in love for their work's sake and be at peace amongst yourselves. Seems pretty clear. You're supposed to, I know I am unlovable except to Denise and my children, but the scripture says you're supposed to love me. Acts 20. 26 to 31. This is Paul's last time talking to the pastors from the city of Ephesus. And he said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Same word, bishop to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. So this is for both of us. Because we're reminded that the pastor is supposed to oversee the flock because wolves are coming and it's the under-shepherd's job to protect the flock. That's why we had that conversation earlier. Wool, I, I'm supposed, I have threatened to whip somebody. It was a man, but a man, actually a group of men came in the church I was pastoring and, and, and Think less of me if you want to, but I felt led of the Lord telling me, you come back, I'm going to whip you. If I catch you in any of these people's houses, I'm going to whip you. And if they put me in jail, when I get out, I'm coming over to that yellow building y'all call the church, and I'm going to whip you again. It's the pastor's job to, to protect the flock. Amen. Wolves are coming. Mm -hmm. First Peter 5, 1, the elders which are among you. Elder is a, it's not always a pastor, but in this case it is. A pastor should be a married man with children. The elders which are among you who am who am also an elder, Peter himself, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed in him, feed the flock of God. That's my job. It was suggested this week that I let somebody else preach on Wednesday night so we could have church at like 4 o'clock. We all decided to have church at 7 and, and to have a meal at 6 and start a little earlier. 
God called me to be the pastor. I'm supposed to be the one filling the pulpit unless I am hindered from that by something that I can't control. Right. Feed the flock. Take the oversight there. Not by constraint. Hopefully, after two years of being the pastor of the church, you know that I do not rule by constraint. I have never taken anybody by the arm and made them do anything. But willingly. Not for filthy lucre's sake. Not because I get a big check. Obviously, if I'm working outside the church, I'm not doing it for a big check. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in sample. Hey, I'm not perfect. I told you Sunday. I'll tell you again. I'll tell you next Monday. I'm not perfect. But I'm trying to be the in sample that God wants you to be. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory. Amen. Ephesians 4. I can't, I can't read you the whole text, but he gave some. I can't read you the whole text because it's very lengthy. But he gave some. It's kind of the first, Verse 11 is kind of like a timeline. He gave some apostles. There ain't no more of them. He gave some prophets. There ain't no more of them unless you consider that to just mean preacher or, or evangelist. But the next word is evangelist. And I believe from studying scripture that's a church planter and some pastors and teachers. Well, that's who you got. Well, why did he give you a pastor? For the perfecting of the saints. Mm -hmm. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body. How long did he give you a pastor? Till we all come into the unity of faith. And to the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. Who is that? Jesus Christ. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that we be no more henceforth tossed about to and fro. Carried about with every wind of doctrine. I can't read the rest of it to you. But it's my job. To preach the word until the church is unified in its understanding of Scripture. 2 Timothy 2 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold your to excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2 15. Therefore, stand fast, brethren, and hold the traditions which ye have both taught, been taught, and whether by our word, excuse me, by word or our epistle. So whether I use the Bible or I wrote you the letter with some scriptures in it, so I have to preach it that you have to stand fast in it. Hebrews 13, we read 7, verse 7, excuse me, we read 17, verse 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 28, that pastoring was harder than all the other perils that he faced, the care of the churches. 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders that rule well be counted, notice, rule, well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. That's what I'm trying to do right now. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox who treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Again, here's the part that I think is for you. Obviously, you're supposed to honor the pastor, and, and y'all do that, Okay. But it says, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. If somebody tears me down to you, I think scripturally, I should be able to hear what they say. The two or three witnesses, I need to be one of them. It is not of God to sit on the sidelines and throw rocks at God's man. There is no place in Scripture where that is blessed except one that I can think of. It's not really blessed, but David wouldn't do anything to a man. David's walking down the street, and they're walking down the road, and there's a man walking beside him, cussing him, and kicking rocks at him. And David's men wanted to kill the man. And David said, no, leave him alone. But when you find out that was Bathsheba's daddy, and he murdered her first husband and took her to be his wife, you can understand why daddy was upset and David never let them do anything to the man. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 5, he talks about desiring the milk of the word. And he also talks about eating the meat of the word. So it's my job to give you the milk and the meat you never get too old for milk. I love milk. I drink milk every day. The milk of the word, John 3, 16. We would call that the milk of the word. I never get over the fact that he loves me. 
but we need to be eating the meat, okay? Three minutes to give you 45 more minutes of sermon. <laughs> In 2 Kings chapter 1, I'm just going to try to tell you quickly these two texts. In 2 Kings chapter 1, Jezebel sent some fellows to arrest Elijah. And they said to Elijah, Come down, thou man of God, come down here. said, if I be a man of God, let fire eat you up. And they were gone. Mm -hmm. They sent more people. Same rudeness. Thou be the man of, thou, thou man of God, come down here. If I'm the man of God, may fire come down. They're gone. The third one, come around with his hat in his hand. Uh, Dear man of God, the queen would like to see you. Would you please come? Now that's Holman's translation, but that's basically the way it went. And he went with him. And in the next chapter, he was received up into heaven. Mm -hmm. In that next chapter, I guess this is, y'all you know, should be thankful I'm not a ball head, amen. But a bunch of kids said to the man of God, come up thou ball head. And the Lord sent two she bears to eat those kids. We don't make fun of God's name. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy 4. 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware? For he hath greatly withstood our words. And at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. In other words, Alexander the coppersmith was attacking. Even in the New Testament, God don't want people. God don't want God don't want people, especially those people who claim to be Christian, tearing down God's man. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to tear people down? Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Look, I'm going to get real with you. As my daddy used to say, where the rubber meets the road. You remember my cliche about the boat and the river? When you have the boat and the river, things are as they should be. When you get the river and the boat, you have problems. Uh -huh. Okay? We'll replace boat with church and river with world. When you have the church in the world, things are as they should be. Mm -hmm. When you get the world in the church, mm -hmm. we have problems. The world does not like to be corrected. The world does not want you to even point out what they're doing wrong. The world, if you do correct somebody, you have to do it in such a way that 90% of the people aren't even going to realize you're correcting them. That everything has to be positive. There are people who think pastoring should be that way. Mm. Now, I don't think pastors should be mean. There are some pastors that I wouldn't walk across the street. That they, they preach the same Bible I do, and for the most part, they preach the same doctrine I do, but I wouldn't walk across the street to hear them preach because they are so mean. I hope you've never seen that from me as I preach. But to think that everything could be cookies and milk is a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. You know, it is recorded five times that Christ turned to his disciples and said, Oh, ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. Did you know it's recorded that two times he turned around and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. That's correction. I'm not thinking you can say get behind me Satan in a sweet and cookies and milk kind of a fashion. Mm -hmm. He spoke firmly to the lost. 
You have ears, but you don't hear. You have eyes, but you don't see. I want you to tell me how he called a group. Now, they were religious but lost. But I want you to tell me how he said to a group of religious people, you're a generation of vipers and hypocrites with cookies and milk, milk and toast. But there's no way to call somebody a hypocrite and a snake with cookies and milk. He turned the tables on people trying to buy and sell in the Lord's house. He took a whip and literally ran some people out of the church. Hmm. So I go back to Romans chapter 12. If anybody's going to run somebody out of the church, it needs to be the Lord or his under shepherd. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anybody that I wish to run out of the church who's here or who is remotely associated with the church and not here. So don't think I'm saying that. I'm just saying if it ever comes to that time, it should be the pastor to do that. I hope you know, again, after two years, that I do my dead-level best to be sweet and encouraging. But I ain't always going to succeed. I try to be like Christ. I try to walk in the Spirit. Sometimes the Lord, through His Spirit, leads me to mention some issue, some sin, some situation. But I protect people's privacy. I don't put people's dirty laundry out where everybody can see it. But I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like this. When I'm teaching class, Jennifer... And somebody's asking me a question. If somebody else in the room is talking, so if you were asking me a question and, and, and Emma was talking or Lorelai was talking, I would say, hey, let's listen to see what she says because you may have the same question she has. So the same thing, when I, I, I find out there's an issue in the community, whatever, somehow associated with the church, you may face the same thing. And the Holy Spirit may lead me to talk about it, but he ain't going to have me tell your name. But if you're facing something and you share that with me, I may share that publicly. To be honest, I've done that recently and somebody thanked me for it. So I, I, I believe that I do my best to follow the Holy Spirit on what I preach, when I preach, and how I preach it. Listen, I'm trying to shut up. I preach a sermon from 2 Samuel chapter 23 about David's mighty men. Mm -hmm. And the three points that I want to bring out right now is if we're going to succeed for Christ, there's three things that, at least on one point, there's 13 points of the sermon. Y'all know who I am, but favor God's man. Fuel God's man. You do that by saying amen every now and again. You do that by saying, I'm not verbal. I can't do that. Look at me when I'm preaching. That is a fuel in itself that you're attentive to what I'm saying. Second Samuel verse. I'm not turning there, but 23. Uh, uh, you're going to have to forgive me sometimes because I'm going to make mistakes. If you don't think I make mistakes, just ask her <laughs> and ask them. Okay? I make mistakes. Let me tell you what you do when I make a mistake. Pray for me. If I hurt your feet in some way, come tell me about it. We'll talk through it. Let me tell you what you don't do scripturally. Is go tell everybody else how the preacher hurt your feelings. There's no place for it and there's no profit in it. Okay? Not saying anybody's done that. Just what the Lord told me to preach tonight. tonight. i tell you another thing that you don't need to do, which a lot of us, and sometimes I'm one of them, is we like to have a pity party. And that is not profitable. You go back to the scripture. 
What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are good report? Think on the good things. I mean, yeah. I, surely in two years I've done something that you like. So think on those things, okay? <sighs> David was anointed king while he was a shepherd. Amen. And in second, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, David said to Saul, Saul was in a cave. Saul was taking care of his business. I'll just leave it at that. So while Saul is occupied taking care of his business, David cut off part of his clothing so he could hold it up and go, hey, the Lord delivered you into my hand. The rest of the verse. This day thine eyes have seen how the Lord had delivered thee into my hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. I said, I will not put more forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. So if the Lord's servant fails, Unless it is some gross error, give it to the Lord. Amen. A day of dedication. I got to close. I really am. I'm going to be done in two minutes. You'll be done by 12. Minutes. So the end of it. The vast difference between sonship and discipleship. When Peter sinned, he did not lose his sonship. We already talked about this. Christ fed him before he corrected him. But he did lose fellowship. He fell away from true discipleship. True discipleship is following Christ, come what may. But even after the correction, after he's told Christ three times that he would follow him. Yes, I love you. Okay, I'll feed your lambs. Yes, I love you. I'll feed your sheep. Yes, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you, feed my sheep. He still took his eyes off Christ and looked at John. That's not the secret to success in the Christian life. The Bible says, Be encompassed or circled about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Amen. There are things that I would like to do, mm -hmm. to be perfectly frank with you, that I see no scriptural justification for me refraining from doing them, except... All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Right. I might cause somebody else to stumble if I partake of this or if I do the other thing. So I lay aside that weight. I remember, I'll give you an example. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I love red man chew in the back. I ain't had it in years, but I liked it. And I bet I could have a chew right now and like it. But when I was a boy, I met a preacher. My daddy said, this is brother so-and-so. He passed through such and such a church. And he went. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to leave you hanging. <laughs> I said, preachers don't chew tobacco. I miss chewing tobacco. My papa went 40 some odd years without a chew. And he told me when he was pretty close to dying that he still missed it. He said, I believe I could eat a bag of Applejack chewing a bag of right now. <laughs> Unless I did something like that all the time where it caused a health thing, I don't think that would hurt my walk with Christ. But it would hurt my testimony before you. That's so right. I don't do it. That's right. It's important to me. That's a weight. There's nothing wrong with watching TV. I like to watch TV. I like to watch detective programs, probably because my father liked to watch detective programs. And my mind is generally active trying to figure out who did what while I'm watching it. But if that keeps me from reading my Bible, then I got to lay that aside. That's a weight. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the sin. Uh, the sin that does so easily beset us. What Emma faces, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't quiz my children. I don't know what, but everybody struggles with something, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you struggle with, Caroline. I don't know what Joe struggles with, but everybody struggles with something. 
And we're commanded to lay aside the weight. That's the things that's not necessarily right or wrong, but they may cause us to fail to do something good or to do something wrong. And the sin, which is definitely wrong. And run with patience. I told you this before, but let me get you again. This is like a marathon runner. <laughs> a marathon is 26.2 miles. You don't just start out sprinting 26.2 miles. You have to set a pace that you can keep. They run with patience. They start a set. Every one of them I know that finishes them pretty much runs the same pace from beginning to end. To run with patience, run with endurance. The race that is set before us, I don't have to run Philip Wayne Sidley's race. I don't have to run Joe's race. Excuse me, Joachim's race. All right? I don't have to run Nathan's race. Praise God, I wouldn't want to back up to another 16. Okay? I like my life right now. It's got problems, but I don't I don't want to start over. <laughs> Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured such contradiction of sinners, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Now I should be able to say to you, follow me as I follow Christ. But your eyes got to be on Christ. My eyes have to be on Christ. That's right. we're going to be. We need to be devoted to him. Peter had a couple of failures. I almost allowed my failures to keep me from preaching. Aren't you glad Peter didn't? Mm -hmm. God used Peter. Peter stuck his foot in his mouth repeated times. The next time Peter preaches, that's recorded after this, 5,000 people got saved. Mm -hmm. Peter opened the door to the Samaritans. Peter opened the door to the Gentiles. God used Peter. I don't know how you failed Christ, but I am confident that everybody here has failed Christ at some point. But God can take that failure turn it into victory. God can, if you submit to God, if I submit to God, He can take that failure and turn it into victory. Or as I spent so many years whining about the years that I wasted in rebellion until Keith Kaiser said to me one day, listen, I don't want to hear you say that anymore, son. You need to read Joel. You need to read this particular verse. I'd have to look it up to tell you exactly which verse it is, but it's in chapter 2, and the Bible says the Lord will restore the years that the canker worm hath eaten. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're sitting here tonight, and you know you wasted some time that you could have been serving Christ. Believe it or not, a 12 or 13-year-old could have wasted time. A 21-year-old could have wasted time. A 54-year-old has definitely wasted time, and I'm not going to hazard a guess on the ladies' ages except my wife's. I know what <laughs> But the Lord can restore the times that we have failed Him and turn them in to more profitable times for eternity. I'm sure that. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that gathered out here tonight. I pray that I have preached what you wanted me to. I'm sorry I took over time, Lord, but I pray that you take this to the church's heart and that we would draw closer to thee and that you would give us a new fervor for souls. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Bye now.